Okay. Well, I said I'd be uh, recording a video about the writing assignment. I'm going to do that today. Um, so your final exam for Phil 101 for fall 2015 uh, is going to be a final writing assignment. Uh, this final writing assignment is where you show me what you've managed to take from the course. Right? This is also where you place yourself in dialogue with what you've learned and show that you've got some sort of a critical or philosophical understanding of the material. I'm just going for my coffee that um, that we've studied in this course. Right. So this is, I, I know the quizzes have been a little bit straightforward that don't ask you to take a position or make an argument to yourself. This is where I'm asking you to make an argument. So um, final writing assignment um, is due uh, December 14th by 11.55 p.m. That's last call for the class. Um, it's uh, all assignments are going to be submitted through Moodle so make sure it's in um, on time uh, because especially for these final assignments uh, I can't be accepting late, late assignments um, because my deadline for submitting grades after this is 48 hours later I have to get right to grading these in sort of a ridiculous amount of time there are over a hundred of you and um, I have to <laughs> grade all of this plus your final quizzes plus assess grades for the forums plus tally all these final grades switch them to four-point grades and submit them to the office of the registrar by December 16th right so um, there is it, no more time I've already given you all of the time that I can with this final writing assignment note that this is why I um, have required the forum come in on December 7th uh, that will get you thinking about and working on the paper ahead of time right so um, here's a bit about what I'm looking for um, it, yeah, I've, I've posted a number of resources to Moodle for you, including a sample structure for writing philosophy papers. Hopefully this will help you organize your ideas because generally I find that students, when they um, sit down to write a paper, if they haven't written many of these papers in the past, what they wind up doing is try to write the entire paper all at once and everything comes out as a jump. Um, so it gives you lots of tips that I'll relay some of them today um, on how to organize your thoughts into a cogent argument um, and not do too much all at once. Um, sentences, paragraphs, that sort of thing, I'm expecting complete sentences that make grammatical sense. Um, this will be assessed in terms of the, the, the clarity part of your assessment. Um, I'm also looking for insightful papers that do something a little bit on the critical side with this material. Um, I'm also looking for you to display an understanding of the theories that you're engaging with. Right. So um, at least part of it is getting it right, um, part of it is constructing an argument, and part of it is talking about ideas in a clear manner. Um, so these, these are sort of my criteria when I sit down to grade through these papers. Um, so right, you've got till December 14th. Uh, for this um, and I've posted uh, a choice between three topic questions um, below. So what I've got on the board behind me here um, are a few steps that you should take uh, with regard to framing your papers. So step one is choose a question. The questions are, um, well they all start off with, given the argument studied in this course, uh, the first one is describe the most uh, basic nature or condition of the human being. Um, I'm particular with language there because the last two theorists, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche, are less interested in presenting a human nature but rather describing a situation that human beings are thrown into and asked to give meaning to and make sense of. Whereas uh, the theorists beforehand from Socrates to Plato to Aristotle to Hobbes have started off by defining human beings before for actually engaging with particular human beings. So we are something by essence or by definition and we particularly are just just examples of that definition. 
right? So that's the first question. Uh, the second one, um, given the argument studen, studied in this course, uh, what's the role of the faculty of reason related to the human passions or desires? Each of the theorists um, that we've studied have to some extent or another suggested a role for the faculty of reason, whether that role be um, is secondary to the passions or primary, uh, saying that it should control the passions. So for sure, the ancient philosophers that we studied place reason on top. Reason should be that which, for Plato, guides the chariot. Right? For Aristotle, reason is what's able to sort out our desires, so reason's in charge. For Socrates, we should be persuaded, what, by our passions, by our opinions, by our desires? No, by reasons. The only thing that should matter is the quality of our reasons. And for Hobbes, um, reason is just a tool of the passions. It allows us to calculate threat and advantage um, and anticipate what's going to satisfy our, our, our appetites and that which we're, we're going to be adverse to. So reason is a tool that we use to gain, acquire, and, and exercise our power in the world. Right. So um, it's sort of a secondary role for Hobbes. Again, for Kierkegaard, uh, he presents us with a problem, despair, that reason can't help us with. He suggests that faith should be that which we turn to instead. Uh, reason can only get us so far. Reason fails uh, in terms of giving meaning to our lives. Not that we should be irrational, but rather that we should acknowledge the limitations of reason. And then finally with Nietzsche, what we find is that reason again is a tool of the passions. We find this quite clearly in the problem of Socrates, um, it, where he argues that um, effectively what Socrates did is um, turn reason into a tyrant, a counter tyrant to our passions, which were running amok. Right? Nietzsche, on the other hand, suggests that we should spiritualize our passions, right? make use of and deploy our passions rather than turn our passions into the slaves of reason, which is, <coughs> excuse me, for Nietzsche, just another passion. Right? So um, e each of the theories we've discussed engage with that question. And then finally, number three, given the argument studied in this course, what can we say about the underlying nature of truth? Um, you, you, not much according to Socrates. Truth is out there. We're not skeptical about it, but we don't know it in an absolute sense, though it suggests sort of an ethical code and a, a set of duties for human beings. This is how he's able to ground his moral reasoning argument. Uh, for Plato, he's explicit that the truth is the forms. And for Aristotle, he's got this distinction between essence and accident, the, the, the whatness and the thisness of a thing. And to some extent, right, Aristotle is able to ground his ethics in this sort of notion of truth. Right? It's only because there is some sort of a truth that there is a condition of flourishing for the human being, one in which our essence is expressed most completely and most fully. That is how we're able to actualize our potential. Now, we turn to Hobbes, and the truth is just sort of the blunt fact of the world. There's nothing like metaphysical truth. We see this in terms of his treatment of moral truth. Moral truth, just we we turn to self-interest, right? This is why the laws of nature and the science of the laws of nature by Hobbes is considered moral philosophy. It doesn't make reference to any truth that's other than the bare, brute fact of existence, right? So largely, truth is non-metaphysical. It's this-worldly, right? Um, it, for Kierkegaard, right, truth, God. It's fairly obvious, that sort of thing, but we cannot know the truth. We have to have faith in the truth, and it's a leap, right? Um, that's, that's, that's subjectively necessary, not objectively valid, right? And Nietzsche, if I were describing Nietzsche in terms of Plato, I'd draw that entire sketch of Plato with the cloud up here and the human being looking at the box down here, and I'd draw an X through the metaphysics 
I draw an X through the soul, and largely what remains is the human being engaged with the world in a way that demands that the human being express its will, its power. It, 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 it basically, it's a very this worldly theory of truth, right? That spirit has some sort of role in. Right? So you see, each and every one of the theorists that we've discovered or that we've studied in this course engage with these questions. So step one is ask yourself what you're interested in. Human nature, the relationship between reason and the passions or desires, or uh, truth. Right? Um, so those are the questions. Just ask yourself which one speaks to you. And then step two is pick two theorists. Right? Um, pick two theorists that somehow jumped out at you in this course, that somehow spoke to you in this course. Right? To a certain extent, I mean, this doesn't mean you have to agree with these theoretical positions. Some of the best papers I've ever read, uh, written have been critical of the theories, right? Um, for a theory to jump out at you, sometimes the theory that jumps out at me it just jumps out because you know, there's something wrong with it, right? And largely my effort, my reasoning, my critical endeavor is framed by figuring out what the, what, what the heck is wrong with this theory. I've given you the opportunity to pick two of these theorists. You don't have to agree with them, you don't even have to particularly like them, but nonetheless, they have to speak to the topic that you've picked in some way that you find interesting or important. All right. So, all right. So, you've picked your question. You've picked your two theorists. Let's let's just you pick on number one as an example. Given the argument studied in this course, describe the most basic nature or condition of the human being. Uh, why don't we just do something simple like Socrates and Plato as our example? Right? So let's say you pick question number one, and let's say you pick Socrates and Plato as the theorists that we've studied in this course to frame your paper. So you ask yourself, what is the basic issue in terms of distinguishing between Socrates and Plato? Well, what were human beings, according to Socrates, beings who should be persuaded by reasons, beings who are basically good? Remember the Socratic dicta, knowledge is virtue, those that know the good do the good, and evil arises as an involuntary error to ignorance. Generally, when we do the good, we attend to the health of our psyche or our soul. When we do evil, it stems from ignorance, and largely what we are doing is harming our soul. Right. This argument came out nicely in the Apology. Right. So, Socrates is very optimistic with regard to the underlying moral quality of human beings. This is basic to our nature. We're re rational and we are coming into some sort of relationship to the truth. Right. And once we come into a knowing relationship with the truth, we all automatically become good people, or at least the only th reason we do wrong things, you know, nasty, jerky, selfish, self-interested, hurtful kinds of things, is because we don't know any better. So that's Socrates' position. On the other hand, Plato wants to expand this kind of moral psychology. So your Plato section for this this uh, might have to do with, uh, remember that question I gave you about the constitution of the soul on that um, Plato quiz? This is going to be very important. Right? So we've got this immortal soul. It's not so different than Socrates, though Socrates doesn't at this point argue that it's immortal. He calls it a soul or a psyche. Right. For Plato, he argues that it's immortal, and it's made up of these three parts, reason, self-control, and desire. Right. So, the goal for Plato is to bring the soul into harmony. The soul is basically good insofar as the things that it desires, the things that it's directed towards, or that which properly nourish the soul. And if we come into relation properly with them, bringing harmony to the soul, we become good people who do fine actions. Right. 
the deal, though, is that to a certain extent, this can, involves an element that was missing in Socrates. That is self-control. We've got to use reason and temperance to, in a sense, restrain, retrain, and redirect the impetuous element of our soul. So what, is, what has Plato done? He's expanded the moral psychology of of, of, of the, the position by offering an account of how we can know the good, but plan old not do it. All right? When it, and this was it came out quite clearly um, in on page 18 of your Phaedrus, where he defines eros as the unreasoning desire that overpowers a person's impulse to do right and is driven to take pleasure in beauty. Our desire is part of the soul, overcomes our better elements, and it makes us do something other than right. So we can intellectually know the good, but still not do it. So what Plato's done is offered an account of something that Socrates did not. It's an expansion. It's an interesting expansion. Right? And your topic, your thesis, could be that it's an interesting and valuable expansion. Or, if you think Plato's wrong somehow, it could be a critique of Plato. All right. Not necessarily a defense of Socrates. You could claim that both of these theorists stop short of acceptable with regard to their treatment of moral psychology. Maybe they're both naive, and psychology, modern psychology, might be what's necessary. Right? Neither of them treat the body as something that's important with regard to the moral condition of a human being, and we know enough about neurobiology to claim that both of these positions fall short. It's, I mean, you see what I'm asking you to do is to treat these theorists and then put yourself in a position of dialogue with them. So what I've got laid out here is you've got an introduction. I'd write this last, right? I wouldn't even write the introduction. I'm writing a big, big, big dissertation right now. I'm almost done. I still haven't written my introduction. I wait till the end because when the argument shakes out, then I'll have a better idea of what the introduction should be. Right? So I would write the introduction last. The introduction should isolate the problematic, right? the moral psychology and the example that I'm giving you, and present a, theorist, a, 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 a thesis. Right. Uh, let's say that um, the both Socratic and Platonic moral psychology fails to grasp something that modern neurobiology is able to treat, right? explain, and offer a solution to. So effectively, both Socrates and Plato's moral theories fall short because they didn't have access to modern neurobiological sort of science. All right. um, that could be perfectly acceptable. You could argue that uh, even modern neurobiology, let's just put that aside, it's sort of a crutch. It, 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 it might actually, something that we should be morally responsible for it tends to medicalize so as to create an excuse. What both Socrates and Plato do is put responsibility for controlling yourself on you and you should be able to limit your desires yourself using reason right? so um, that's another perfectly acceptable argument you could argue that socrates is superior to plato because to a certain extent um, plato falls short right the theory of the forms is weird and we can't use that as a limiting sort of factor for, for for the human condition socrates is more accurate socrates could be inferior to plato insofar as he did not actually expand to treat this knowledge yet still don't do the good element right it could be anything it largely this is where you put yourself into this is my position is that and this is my main thesis statement right so you isolate the problematic from the two theorists that you've um chosen and take a position crafting yourself a thesis statement the first parts of your paper should devote it, it, it just just get the positions from these theorists onto page. Try to do as clear and concise a job as possible of introducing the theorists in question. Right? So Socrates says Plato argues. 
right? You introduce only the aspects of their theory that are going to be important or relevant to the argument that you want to make, right? Because you could write a book on either of them. Lots of people, tons of people have. Um, so largely, uh, the first parts of the paper are setting the background. It's, I, I like to think about this like constructing a narrative. And it, largely, the first thing that you're going to have to do if you're constructing a narrative is set the scene. Right? It's it, it, think about the Lord of the Ring movies, right? Where it goes in do 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 do, and you're given this sort of impression of the state of affairs in Middle Earth, right? Um, it, you're doing basically the same thing. Do, 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 do. The first parts of the paper, you're giving an impression of Socrates and Plato. These are their positions. This is what they argue. Right? The next part of the paper is your argument, where you use what you did in the first parts of the paper to make your argument isolate aspects of what you've introduced in the first parts of the paper. So whereas Socrates argues, Plato argues, you see what I'm claiming is, right? And then you conclude. And generally what I want to claim about the conclusion is that uh, the conclusion doesn't only go back and it's not the sandwich style of a paper, right? So you, you see how I did everything I said in my introduction? The conclusion might actually isolate where you go next from this, why it might be interesting to reflect on what this says about human beings trying to give their lives meaning in the world, etc. Expand the paper beyond the bounds of the paper. Right? It's, just, it's just good writing. So, um, largely I've presented that sample structure to you on Moodle as just a suggestion. Right? It's what I do. I actually do part one, part one A, part one B, etc., etc. Right? Um, I, my papers can be quite harsh that way. I've been criticized for that in the past, but nonetheless, it allows me to do one thing at a time and do it well. I, that, that, that is why I, I separate my papers that way. And if people don't like the part one kind of thing, I just delete the words part one. Um, and one last thing, um, plagiarism, don't do it. I've got a big note on uh, your, your, your assignment page about don't do that. It's on the course syllabus. Um, if you're unsure about how to how to reference, um, go to that site rate program. Uh, there's a link on the course syllabus uh, for that. It's quite good. I've been through it. I've learned things. Um, it's uh, also something I've noticed with the assignments. It's not enough to just say, these are the works I used. You've got to, in the actual text, when you're grabbing text from those works you're using, tell me that that's text that's from those works. Otherwise, I don't know what's you and what's not you. All right. Um, so hopefully um, this has been at least a little bit handy to you. And um, I look forward to reading these. Um, I especially look forward to reading these. I, I, I rarely look forward to reading your quiz responses because they're pretty direct. Um, but this is where you actually present me with arguments of your own. So I'm especially interested in these. All right. Thank you and um, have good days, one for each of you.